So this is the result of months of research as I did my thesis. I obviously can't show you every single study I went into here, but just know that the ones that I do show you throughout this video are only a fraction of what I've read into. Let's start with housing and the other variables that are going to affect our results. Temperature. Now this plays a major role in the amount of food consumed. One study struggled to get the exact calcium amounts required by using ambient temperatures between 23 and 41 degrees Celsius. Now another study had better results keeping temperatures above 26 degrees Celsius. And then another one proposed that crickets show a preference for temperatures between 26 and 32. And then another study had complete success at temperatures from 26 to 29. Now based on these varying methodologies, I would actually suggest a minimum temperature for your crickets of 26 degrees. Now, one very elaborate study suggested a vertical thermal gradient with ceramics and stuff at the top. However, I do recognize that myself and anyone that wants to watch this, we want to keep things as cheap as possible. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to put the tub on top of a vivarium that's going to be heated from the melamine below and I'm going to get it an inverse thermal gradient of 30 or whatever it gets to at the bottom on the wood and then 26 at the top of the cardboard. Security. Now the proximity of food placed to security is going to impact their willingness to feed. One study found that dishes placed closer to egg cartons experienced a greater rate of consumption than those out in the open. Shortly after shipping, the differences in consumption between dishes wasn't actually significant. However, after 50 hours, the dish in the dark closest to the egg carton was fed from significantly more, showing that once that initial hunger from shipping was satiated, security became a higher priority. So placing food in secure areas is going to maximise our chances of consumption. It sounds silly, but little things like this are going to make all the difference. I created a hide out of an old plastic dish to place food under to add extra layers of security, as well as placing the food wallward facing to increase feelings of security. I did actually consider an opaque tub, but I don't actually know what impact limiting access to light and what effects this might actually have on their circadian rhythm and hormones. I do not want anything Thing limiting their urge to feed, although I found no literature testing this, so perhaps experiment with that. Cricket growth cycles. Crickets go through stages called instars in between each exoskeleton molt. It's this stage between these molts that is the stage of growth and feeding. Now the rate of growth and the time spent in between these instars is entirely variable, and it's going to come down to like heating, the amount of food offered, so it's entirely variable. Crickets are intermittent feeders and feed for around six hours after molting and continue until mid-instar. Feeding intermittently, filling portions of their digestive system so that they maintain a distended crop and full midgut. When crickets are at the end of an instar, ingestion decreases or even ceases, meaning gut loading potential will be at this lowest at this time. Now we have two options here to skip on top of this. Either we measure the amount of food consumed by putting food in petri dishes and then taking those dishes out to weigh them so that when there's a massive drop in consumption compared to usual we can be pretty sure that they're not in a feeding or growth stage and they're coming up to a molt stage. Now obviously adult crickets that are at the final molt and they're not expected to molt again are going to be a less of a concern with this. However, because they are at the final adult stage, they have their reproductive tracts now, meaning that less of the body as a percentage is gastrointestinal tract. So it swings in roundabouts really. Nutrition. Crickets contain adequate amounts of protein and are good sources of amino acids. Crickets also have decent levels of fats and adequate fatty acids. Although their omega-6 to omega-3 ratios may not actually reflect that of wild insects, but more on that later. The most important nutrients that crickets fall short on, and are actually the nutrients that we see in deficiencies quite a lot in reptiles, is calcium and vitamin A. But I have also investigated carotenoids, vitamin E, and omega-6 to omega-3 ratios. Calcium. It's required for bone structure, neuromuscular function, intercellular signaling, blood clotting, and enzyme activation. Most vertebrates require a calcium to phosphorus ratio of 1 to 1 to 2 to 1, to maintain proper homeostasis, and this should be mirrored in the diet. Now, the general recommendation in the literature is calcium anywhere from 5% to 8% to be included in the gut loading diet. This is high enough to achieve calcium gut loading goals, but not so high that it makes it unpalatable and decreases consumption. 
Now that being said, there may be some diets that are way higher than this, but they have other nutrients that are actually really palatable, so it offsets this. High calcium diets typically increase cricket mortality after 72 hours. Now, long story short, it basically causes an impaction in the hindgut and the rectum. I'm going to leave a pinned comment from me with an extract from my thesis for the whole detailed explanation of this, but it's far too detailed for me to ramble through in this video. So if you want to read that, check in the comments. So if you can't seem to keep crickets alive for very long, then it might be that you're actually feeding these high calcium gut loading diets constantly for the duration that you're keeping them and actually killing them with calcium. Therefore, what we should actually be doing is batch gut loading. Have a maintenance group of your crickets and then when you're going to feed off, take some of those, put them in a separate container. This is your batch gut loading group. Now this means that these can be gut loaded for 40 hours before you intend to feed them. It stops the ones in the maintenance group dying of calcium impactions, but also it's going to save us more money because we're not using this commercial gut loading diet constantly, but rather only when we're gut loading a batch of crickets. Now by gut loading, the crickets will maintain their more than one to one ratio of calcium for far longer once they're put in the enclosure before they empty their gastrointestinal contents. Now another option is just to dust them with calcium powders. However, one study found that adult crickets can groom off over half of all powders within two minutes and a half, meaning that if you're going to be tongue feeding it's fine, but if you're releasing them into the habitat to allow the raptor to hunt them, then they may actually remove the powder before being eaten and then not delivering enough calcium powder. Now some authors also report calcium dusting as being the most efficient form of supplementation, while others deem it ineffective. It pretty much depends on how the insect is presented to the reptile. To me, the powder acts as a failsafe if the gut loading is actually just below one to one. So what I do is I'll gut load and then I'll put on a fine amount of calcium powder. I'll feed half that batch tongue feeded in a way that I know that it's getting all that calcium. And the other parts, because I know that I've gut loaded, I'm not so worried about them grooming off the dusting, so I'll allow the other half to be roaming in the enclosure to be hunted. But that way we're allowing the proper nutrition and we're allowing the reptile to actually behaviorally function and hunt. And you're very loud, aren't you? How does Wiccan's beardy just stick to him like glue? Climb, God, get up there, go on, go. Sit there. Right, we're gonna try this with the beardy on my shoulder because she's scratching to get out. So if I have it here, then it shouldn't be noisy. Okay, be quiet, all right? Vitamin A. Now the vitamin A contents in crickets actually fall short of reptile requirements. Now vitamin A or, or retinol is actually only found in the compound eyes of insects when they're synthesized from carotenoid precursors. Now they do this for visual pigment. Now the levels found in eyes are thought to be insignificant sources for reptiles or other insectivores. Now the estimated requirements for wild and domestic lab rats is somewhere between 2,333 to 333,300 international units per kg. Now this is what most gut load literature is based upon. Now Fink recommended providing crickets with a diet containing 27,000 international units per kg to meet the NRC recommendations for rats. Now this is due to the lack of specific information for reptiles and amphibians. Well, Attai proposed 62,000, so you can see how understudied this really is and how variable recommendations are in the literature. Now, the antioxidant component of carotenoids allows them to deoxify reactive oxygen species, as oxidative stress can actually cause damage to lipids, DNA, and proteins. Now, some carotenoids are the precursors of vitamin A. Now, it's unclear which and how many reptiles and amphibians can actually make this conversion. In one study, the false tomato frog could receive pro-vitamin A through crickets supplemented with beta-carotene, lutein, and zeaxithenin. Leopard geckos were also found to obtain sufficient vitamin A hepatic storage through beta-carotene supplementation alone. Now, however, one study found little conversion in cane toads and Cuban tree frogs, suggesting some amphibians may not actually be able to make the conversion to pro-vitamin A. Other authors actually raised concerns about these results, claiming that because they were frozen prior to analysis, this could inf influence results. So it's actually very unclear how many species are actually okay to 100% replace retinal supplementation with beta-carotin or other carotenoid precursors. Now, most herbivores appear to have the ability to make this conversion, so logic would dictate that most omnivores, like bearded dragons, like Nugget here would be able to make the conversion too. Anecdotally, as a hobby, we've probably replaced retinal supplementation with carotenoid precursors for a lot of species and I've seen no negative effects. So it's probably likely that a lot of species can make this conversion, 
but we don't have the exact results from the science yet and you're making me very very distracted nugget now it was found that carotenoid levels were highest in crickets fed fresh fruits and vegetables then fish flakes and then bran isk 2018 also found that a fresh produce diet i.e. fresh chopped carrots, sweet potatoes and kale, had the highest concentrations of carotenoids when compared to commercial gut loading diets. Now this completely contradicts other literature's recommendations though. Small particulate, dry formulated diet should be offered with no fresh produce or selective feeding would limit consumption of unpalatable high CA diets and then hinder results. Carotenoid retention was found to be poor in crickets and thought to be significantly reduced if not eaten within 40 hours or longer. The fact that crickets were found to have very low amounts after fasting suggests that they have very limited ability to actually sequester carotenoids into their body tissues. Vitamin E. Vitamin E works as an antioxidant. It increases immunocompetence and decreases disease susceptibility in mammals. Little is known about the response to dietary antioxidants in reptiles and amphibians. However, one study in leopard frogs supplemented with antioxidants for five weeks resulted in tadpoles with an increased immune response capability and also growth. Now Friel 2019 found that levels of vitamin E in free-ranging cane toads decreased over time in captivity despite dietary supplementation or vitamin E rich veg to crickets. This highlights that provision in captivity may actually be lacking. The interesting thing is that Fink 2015 found that the high levels of vitamin E in crickets was actually a result of them sequestering vitamin E into their, in the, to their tissues rather than a direct result of it just being sat in the GI tract. So crickets actually sequester vitamin E into their tissues. So we can use this to our advantage. So we should be feeding them high amounts of vitamin E as they're growing so that over their lifetime they sequester more and more vitamin E as they grow. Omega-6 to omega-3 ratios. High omega-6 to omega-3 ratios in diets and captivity have been associated with health problems in humans and fish. Now high levels of dietary omega-3 fatty acids have been shown to have beneficial health effects in birds and Wyoming toads susceptible to vitamin A deficiencies by facilitating vitamin A assimilation and transport across cell membranes. Now the lack of information on fatty acids and the omega-6 to omega-3 ratios in captivity for reptiles makes recommendations difficult. However, trying to promote a lower omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in captivity that reflects more of the wild diet should probably be encouraged. Now, Unings reported that for each percentage increase of the diet that included flaxseed oil, the omega-3 content of the crickets increased by 2.3 to 2.7%. A 4% increase decreased the omega-6 to omega-3 ratios from 18 to 36 to 0.8 to 2.4. Now, the lack of research on this makes things really difficult to recommend, but the, also the lack of reported deficiencies and problems associated with high omega-6 to omega-3 ratios don't fall means that it may not be as high as priority as other nutrients. What I'm actually doing myself, basically just unclothing me here, Nugget. Get up. Come on, get up on my shoulder. Go on. So I'm going to separate things into a maintenance diet and a gut loading diet. I'm going to take out the crickets I intend to feed off 48 hours before I intend to feed them off and gut load them with a commercial gut loading diet. In my maintenance diet, I'm including a variety of fresh veg, such as carrots with the beta carotenoids, uh, red bell peppers and green bell peppers. This is just going to be to maintain the growing crickets. The high amount of vitamin E in the peppers means that as they're growing, it's going to be sequestered into their tissues. And that's what I'm looking for long term. Now, red and orange bell peppers have good amounts of zeaxithenin, and green peppers have good amounts of lutein. Now, the commercial diet I'm using is Arcadia Insect Fuel. Now, from personal communications with John Courtney Smith, I now know that it has like 20% calcium in it. So, this is a high calcium amount compared to what is recommended in the literature, but also, it is readily accepted by my feeders, so I'm not too concerned about it reducing palatability and reducing consumption because I see them eating it quite re readily. But it also has things in it like bee pollen and things like that that I normally would buy separately anyway. So cost-wise, it works out much more cheaper to use insect fuel than to buy things separately. I'm then dusting with Arcadia Earth Pro A as my fail-safe for CA and also for those extra carotenoids that it has inside it. Yeah, on the off chance that they are actually poor converters to carotenoids, I'm, go I'm just going to include a little bit of retinol in a diet once a week just to, as a fail safe. So I'm hoping that from seeing this video you've seen the research that is there and we've taken this research and we thought about what is actually 
a sensible and doable approach for us as keepers. And if you want to see a video about how I keep costs down for Nugget here by maintaining a dubia colony, then watch this video up here.